From the WKYT studios in Lexington, this is Kentucky Newsmakers with Bill Bryant. Good morning and welcome to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers on this cold November weekend. Later, the vice mayor elect of Lexington will join us and talk about issues facing the city. Steve Kay has already served for some years on city council. Now he will steer Lexington's legislative body. Steve Kay will be with us shortly. But first, the open enrollment period for Kentucky Connect, the state's health care exchange under the Affordable Care Act, is now open starting this weekend. Kentucky's exchange was praised across the the nation for its simplicity and how well it functioned as the federal healthcare.gov site had so many problems last year. You remember all that. Have the options changed? Where can you learn more? Carrie Banahan is the executive director of Kentucky Connect and joins us. And thanks for coming in. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for having me here today. I said, I guess this is a finger crossing time, right? Uh, because well, uh, it's starting out now, the right. open enrollment. Right. You know, b b beginning tomorrow, individuals uh, can log on and start to shop for health insurance plans. And what will they find when mm -hmm. they when they sign mm -hmm. on to Kentucky Connect? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what they'll find is some, some more choices to the marketplace. Due to our success, we have new insurers uh, to WellCare and CareSource, uh, who offers products on the federal exchange in the state of Ohio. Uh, they'll also see a pre-screening tool. Um, last year, uh, it took maybe two or three minutes. You'd enter some basic information about yourself, household income, member information, and we determined whether or not you were eligible for Medicaid or some type of premium subsidy to help pay for your commercial health insurance plan. Uh, but what you saw was the sticker price of that uh, health insurance product. Mm -hmm. So uh, beginning this year, individuals will be able to see uh, the amount of their subsidy applied to the premium. So they'll actually see their net cost. Uh, as we said, uh, Kentucky was held up as a national mm -hmm. model last year uh, when it was rolled out the first time. Uh, do you anticipate a good experience this go around? Oh, we do. We do. You know, we, we've made many enhancements to the system. Uh, the the pre-screening tool. Uh, we've simplified the application process uh, with easier questions. Uh, so certainly we think it's going to be easier for individuals to apply this year. You have different ways of trying to get mm -hmm. the word out, including mm -hmm. a, a store that you've opened mm -hmm. at Fayette mm -hmm. Mall. What, what is that about? We, we do. You know, we're very excited uh, about our store. Uh, stores were in the state of Connecticut as well as Colorado, and they were highly successful. Uh, so we hope that individuals will come to the store and apply either for health insurance products, uh, they can apply for Medicaid. Uh, if they have a pending application, they can drop off information that might have been requested as part of the application process. And there are cell phone apps as well. Now, what does that there, do? There are. Uh, we uh, ha have a, a mobile app available uh, through Apple uh, as well as Google. Individuals will be able to find possibly an agent or connector in their county uh, that can help them enroll through coverage uh, on Connect. You can also uh, find out enrollment events that will be held in your county. We have a preliminary screening tool, uh, takes maybe one or two minutes, that will identify whether or not you're eligible for Medicaid or some type of subsidy to pay for your health insurance costs. Uh, Gary, you mentioned that when people go on the site this year, they will, in other words, they will find mm -hmm. out what their cost is going mm -hmm. to be. So there is that subsidy that comes from the federal government. Mm -hmm. Do we have reason to believe that that uh, federal subsidy will continue, mm -hmm. or could the political environment in mm -hmm. Washington uh, change mm -hmm. that? You know, the subsidy uh, w will go on uh, indefinitely uh, unless there are some changes made to the law, and we believe that's unlikely. Uh, do Kentuckians, do some Kentuckians find that they can get better coverage uh, or maybe at a better price mm -hmm. on the exchange mm -hmm. uh, than they can if they, say, even go through mm -hmm. their employer? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you can get better deals on the exchange in the individual market uh, because we had the subsidy component. An individual that has income of $46,000 a year would qualify for some amount of premium assistance through Connect. A family of four uh, that had income up to $95,000 a year would qualify for some type of subsidy. So you can have, uh, you know, high income and still qualify for a premium subsidy. Now, employer coverage, you know, that, that, that's a different story. Um, if your employer offers you coverage 
and your premium as an employee is less than nine and a half percent of your income, you're not eligible to apply for a subsidy through Connect. All right, so you need to keep that in mind. Would you go to the exchange and be asked to input that information and it would tell you that? Th th that is correct. As part of the application process, we'll ask if you have employer sponsored insurance available to you. And at that time, uh, y y you'd be. Uh, noted that uh, y you might not qualify. The idea, of course, was to get uh, younger and healthier people into the insurance pool and, uh, and to uh, get uh, more people uh, covered. Uh, and that is then that the system basically is carrying the older, sicker people. Is that calculation working out? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there were changes under the Affordable Care Act um, that provided for uh, rates just to be based on age, um, county location, and your smoking status. So individuals, um, you know, th that might have had a higher premium uh, and now have more affordable health insurance coverage. Individuals, uh, you know, that are young, um, anywhere from the age of 18 through 35, can receive uh, a, a good premium rate through Connect. Do you believe that uh, Kentuckians will be healthier going forward uh, if they uh, take advantage of uh, the offerings and the information mm -hmm. uh, that's available to mm -hmm. them as well? Oh, certainly, certainly. You know, Kentucky has been very successful in enrolling individuals into coverage. Um, we've enrolled over a half a million people, um, you know, and, and most of those people, this is the first time they've ever had health care coverage. So this is going to improve the overall health status uh, of Kentuckians. You know, as you know, you know, we rank 50th in, in lung cancer and smoking deaths, 48th in diabetes, 47th in COPD. So uh, through access uh, to coverage, we certainly believe uh, that uh, the, the health care status will be improved. Kentucky rolled the dice and it apparently mm -hmm. paid off in having its own health care mm -hmm. exchange. Do you see the, the exchange uh, changing and evolving mm -hmm. uh, in years to come? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we do have plans. Um, in 2016, uh, the exchange can offer coverage to small employer groups uh, with a size of up to 100 employees. Right now, that limit is 50. In 2017, uh, we can offer coverage to large employer groups. Uh, you know, those that, that, that have over 100 employees. So certainly uh, we, we see our role expanding in the employer group market in the future. All right. Kentucky Connect, uh, beginning this weekend, people mm -hmm. can go on and, uh, and surf and just basically see where they stand, right? I exactly right. I, I mean, we encourage everyone uh, to check it out, um, utilize our pre-screening tool. Uh, also, uh, agents and connectors, uh, they're very important. Uh, if you're unsure uh, of the application process or, or have concerns, uh, we re recommend that you contact an agent or connector. And through our mobile app, you can identify one in your county. And you can also go online on our website and find an agent or connector in your county. All right, Carrie Banahan, who's uh, the executive director of Kentucky Connect. Thank mm -hmm. you and uh, for uh, many years of service in state government. We hope you'll uh, stay with us now on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Lexington Councilman Steve Kay will be with us next. He's set to become vice mayor of the city, and he's up with us coming here up on WKYT. Welcome back to Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. Lexington's city elections are over and some familiar faces return, some leave and others are shuffling around. As you know, Mayor Jim Gray easily won a second term. Lexington's new vice mayor will be Steve Kay. He was the top vote getter for council at large. He came to town about 40 years ago and told his family back in his native New England that he was in a place with the makings of an earthly paradise. As a professional, Kay has worked in team building and communications. He's finishing up uh, four years on council. He will now move up to the position of vice mayor. Steve Kay joining us. We thank you very much for coming. Congratulations. Thank you very much and thank you for having me on. How do you feel about uh, the honor really of being the, uh, the top vote getter for city council and therefore the uh, <laughs> vice mayor elect? Well, I, I am honored. It, um, frankly, it's not something that I expected. Um, I ran because I was interested in serving. I was happy to be a, a council member at large and um, happy to be vice mayor, but I, it was not something that, that, that uh, 
originally I thought, well, you know, what I really want to be is vice mayor of Lexington. And, and frankly, you, you mentioned that I, you know, I came from somewhere else. The people who know me from years ago I kind of can't exactly figure out how it is that, <laughs> that this has happened. But well, I, it, it's terrific. I'm really pleased. But obviously you fell in love with Lexington. And, and, and what, yes. was, what was it uh, that, that made you so drawn to this place as to now at this point in your life uh, being one of the top leaders? Well, I, I traveled through Lexington a couple years in a row when I was quite young on business, and um, I was impressed with the people. I was impressed with the climate, and I grew up in New England. And uh, this morning, as you mentioned, it's pretty frigid out there. Yeah. I was interested in getting someplace a little bit warmer, but uh, I'd been through Lexington, and I thought it was a beautiful place, and the people were friendly, and I had uh, kind of a, got to a point in my life where I could choose where to live, and a friend had gotten a job at UK. And I thought, I'm going to go see what Lexington is like. I didn't know if I would stay or go, but obviously I've stayed. And my wife, who is a native Kentuckian, kids me about being, you know, this kind of like a born-again booster for Lexington <laughs> and Kentucky. But I love it here. And, and it's true. When I first came through, I thought, you know, this is the Garden of Eden. This is an incredibly beautiful place and very, you know, so I, I just loved it at first, love at first sight, and then it's just grown. Well, tell us what it is that you do uh, professionally. It's almost like uh, it can be described as a, as a professional calmer downer. <laughs> when you, you go into these uh, maybe tense situations at times and, and, and sort of uh, get everybody to uh, step back and, uh, and make some decisions. Right. Well, my professional work for the last 35 years or so has been to work with groups often if they're having difficulties with communication or if there are issues that they're facing that they find particularly problematic I come in I help them structure meetings I often lead those meetings for them so if there's somebody in the room who does not have a stake in the issue um, but is paying attention to how the group gets its work done so yes and, and I, I think it's fair to say um, I'm much more of a calmer downer than a, you know, get people excited about something. Well, and in paying attention to uh, uh, what you've done in, uh, in politics in these recent years, you seem to have a, a very strong commitment to that everybody deserves a voice. Well, a good part of my work professionally has been with, um, uh, well, for example, with, with gov before I got elected, with the uh, urban county government in engaging the community in thinking about the issues. So starting in the Basler administration, my partner and I worked on uh, a, a, a program called Speak Out Lexington, which brought people together to think about issues facing the community. And we continued that in uh, Pam Miller's administration. We've worked with the school system on visioning and, and uh, ways to bring people together to think about the issues. So that's been my professional work. When I first ran, I kind of said, I'm going to bring that skill set. Uh, to government uh, from the inside, and I think I've done that. Well, the new council has uh, five new members, more women than ever before yes. on the council. Uh, what will be your top priorities as vice mayor as you sort of, uh, to some extent, run the flow of legislation? Well, I think there's, there's really uh, two things. that the, the way that I think about it is in two ways. One is that we have the good fortune of having recovered mostly from the downturn in the economy. So we're in a relatively decent position to think about what kinds of things we want to invest in for the future. Um, and we have continuity. As you said, Mayor Gray was reelected. So we have an administration that's been in place for four years. And that allows us, I think, to, to think forward. Um, but having said that, there are issues that we've worked on. We just got um, new offices set up for uh, homelessness, for uh, affordable housing, for a local food coordinator. These are things that uh, I worked on pretty much and council did as well. And we've gotten those things in place. We need to make sure that they're uh, now run eff efficiently and effectively. And uh, it's a little hard to say exactly what big issues will be coming down the pike, but we have, we have enough on the agenda. And Mayor Gray says that the two of you generally see eye to eye on things, yeah. uh, but respectfully disagree when you don't. Uh, would you consider yourself uh, one of his advisors, or do you reserve your comments for, uh, for public settings? Well, I would say that I would agree. We, I think we have a very good working relationship. And again, I've, I've, I've known uh, Mayor Gray for a long time before, before he was mayor. And when he was vice mayor, I was a consultant to the Infill and Redevelopment Committee that he co-chaired. So we've worked together before I got on council. And I think we do see a lot of the issues the same way. Um, 
there's a few things in the, in the four years I've been on council where we see things slightly differently. And um, he knows that I'll let him know, um, privately if possible, publicly if necessary, um, that, that we, we see things differently. But I, I view my role as vice mayor as really being the person who helps the council and the mayor and the administration work together effectively. And my default position is we're all trying to do the right thing. We're all trying to get something done for Lexington that's going to make this an even better community. So absent some compelling reason, I think we're trying to work together. Would you anticipate that if uh, he were to be uh, out of town uh, or uh, some way otherwise uh, encumbered and there were a situation that needed immediate attention uh, that he would contact you and you would uh, take reins of city government? Well, it's hard. To, uh, I don't know what kind of a situation that would be, but certainly I'm prepared to do a that. A snowstorm and he's yes, uh, on an economic development trip. Well, you know, the, the, the administration is full of very competent people. And so the mayor's at the top of that, and it's his responsibility to make key decisions. But there are people, so many people in place who know what their job is and know how to do their job that it's hard for me to imagine what kind of a, it would have to be a very serious crisis and the mayor away where I would think, well, now my job is to start telling people what to do. All right. Uh, so you hope you don't get in that sort of thing. Yeah. Well. <laughs> All right. Let, let's talk about uh, some issues. First off, I mean, we are, as you said, in a, a, a very cold period, a weekend, and uh, anticipating even some snow. Right. Is the city ready uh, with a response? We are absolutely ready. Um, we, the council actually uh, had a long back and forth about the question of salt and whether we have enough and when we ought to buy it and so on. But we have a good supply. We have a guarantee of a continued supply. That's one of the key pieces. We need to get salt on the roads when we have bad weather. And the city uh, is moving on the, the homeless issue, uh, but uh, for some, not quickly enough. Well, yes, I think that's, it's fair to say that. And it, this is an issue that affects people very directly. There are, there are people who are themselves, for the moment, homeless. And they are directed, of course, very directly. But it impacts the rest of the community. It's about how we treat those in our community who are least able to help themselves. We worked very hard to get this new office in place, an office of homelessness with a uh, funding stream annually of two million, I'm sorry, of uh, three quarters of a million dollars. So we now have a person in place whose job it is every day to think about how we address this issue. And we're, I think we're doing better. Um, there are a lot of private providers in town. I think people are aware of the Hope Center and the New Life Day Center and the Catholic Action Center and so on, who've spent a lot of their time and energy trying to address this issue. I think we're going to do better. Um, there's, no, there's no magic bullet. Um, we're going to keep working on it. I know it's been a priority of you to uh, sort of wrestle with the issue of affordable housing uh, in its uh, entirety as an issue in this community, uh, which has uh, multi-million dollar homes and then some in substandard houses. Right. Right. So again, we, we worked very hard to get a new office put into place where uh, we were very fortunate to hire a gentleman named Rick McQuady who was the head of the um, Kentucky Housing Corporation for many years. We tired out of that, so he's very knowledgeable about these issues. There's, they have a funding stream of two million dollars a year. And that will be used to basically leverage funds so that the private sector can come in and provide more affordable housing units. I mean, that's the, the, the bottom line is we need more places for, li to, for people who are very low income to live decently. And so we'll be working on that. And again, it's a big problem. Um, the, Lexington is a very appealing place to live. And so we are attracting people at the rate of now about 4,000 a year. So we know there's pressure on housing, and the more pressure there is at the upper levels, the more pressure is at the, at the low income level. So we need to kind of intervene in a way that keeps some balance in that. We don't want to be a community where the people who provide the most basic services can't afford to live here. Council reached a deal with Time Warner after uh, uh, some citizen outcry about uh, the services and about the cable company, and uh, that deal does what? Essentially, it allows the, um, the merger at the national level between Time Warner and Comcast, and then between Comcast and 
Charter, which is another service provider, to, to go forward. We were, we were going to object to that if we could not reach an agreement about the details of the franchise. What guarantees do people have now in this new deal? I think what we got better is um, guarantees that some of the services that have been being provided to the city, the GTV3 and uh, at public access and so on, will continue to be there. There were some questions about that. We've gotten better guarantees that the service itself will be provided more effectively. So longer hours for the service offices to be open and a, a higher penalty if Time Warner or its successor does not provide that service effectively. You also very quickly voted to ban e-cigarettes in indoor public places. Uh, what were the considerations there? I think that was for council fairly easy, a fairly easy decision. The council, our predecessor council, had made the decision to make uh, public buildings and private, private buildings smoke-free. Um, the scientific ev evidence basically tells us that the e-cigarettes also um, are a, are a second-hand danger for smoking. And it seemed, if we had known about e-cigarettes 10 years ago, they would have been included, I think, in the original uh, resolution. And so it was fairly straightforward. Steve Kay is soon to be the vice mayor of Lexington. He's with us on Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. A couple of more questions before we go, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. We're delighted you're with us, and we're visiting with the vice mayor-elect of Lexington, Steve Kay, who will be taking over the official swearing in. what, first of the year? Uh, January 4th, and we should let everybody know that everyone's invited. We'll be in the Bluegrass Ballroom at 2.30 in the afternoon, Sunday, January 4th. The mayor and the council will be sworn in. Do you expect the, the Rupp Arena issue to return to the public dialogue? Uh, obviously, Mayor Gray had uh, a vision for a major overhaul and wants an entire district uh, that would be an entertainment district around Rupp. Right. We all know what happened when he went to, uh, to the state and mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, you know, difficulty there. Uh, but do you see that returning and, and is uh, he likely to pull that off and get that done at some point? Well, I, I like to think that, that we will get that done at some point. Um, I, I think it, it, it needs to be done. It, it, it's a key to the expansion of downtown in a way that will be very good for all of Lexington. And so one way or another, I believe that will get done. Now, um, Obviously, there were some hitches along the way. Uh, there are some concerns on both sides about what's both fair and equitable for the university and for the city. That remains to be negotiated. But I believe that the, we have a common interest here. Um, I think everybody who thinks about these things understands that the city benefits greatly from having the university here. And the university benefits greatly from having a vibrant city. And so. We have a common interest. I believe, given that, we'll find a way to make that move forward. Lexington does well in affordability indexes, uh, uh, ranked uh, seventh in the country and one that was released this week. How do you want to see this city grow in the future? Well, I think that's, that's really the challenge. Um, we have a vibrant community. Most people feel very good about Lexington and, and the direction we're going in. So we're going to continue to grow. And we also have this unusual situation where three-quarters of our county is still in rural land. That makes us different from any other place in the country, maybe any other place in the world. It's a little more like Europe. Um, we need to protect that land, and we want to continue to grow. So that really puts a lot of pressure on what technically is called infill and redevelopment spaces that are still open and places that are now developed that could benefit from being upgraded. We want to do that in such a way that it does not negatively impact the quality of life. So how we do that, when, when we make decisions, um, I think that's the big challenge. Um, I, we are at a good moment. We have the resources to work on that set of issues, um, and I believe we have the will to do that. And I think there's a general understanding about the need both to preserve the rural area and to do the 
kind of more intense development in places where it's appropriate. And despite all the beauty we know, there are some challenges, disturbing shootings and violence over the, uh, the summer months and into the fall. Is enough being done to address that? Well, I believe the answer is that it, it, any, any crime, especially um, uh, violent crime, is unacceptable. Um, but I believe we are doing what we need to do to address that set of issues. <clears throat> We've had a very unfortunate set of, of uh, uh, incidences which have made the community very uneasy. Uh, statistically, we're not out of the bounds of what we've typically been over a year, but that does not make anybody feel any better. Um, we went through a time when we were not able to add uh, police and fire. We have come out of that time. We are doing what we can and we're acting aggressively to make, the, to make up for that time and bring the, the both forces up to full force. Um, we're also putting more emphasis on community policing, which is something that uh, I believe is very effective it's a little more, more costly, but in the long run, it saves us money. Well, holiday preparations are underway. Always a lot of uh, celebrations in the city, tree lighting, uh, parade, and so forth. And I know all of that uh, is something you'll be taking part in as well. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for coming, Steve well, thank Kay, you. Uh, Councilman in Lexington, soon to be the Vice Mayor. And thank you so much for joining us for WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. I'll see you on WKYT this morning, bright and early, 4.30 to 7, on mid-morning at 10, and this week on WKYT News at noon. And you make it a good week ahead.